All right, so thanks guys for coming to Financial Aid 101. Um, I know you all, you all know me. So um, essentially what we're going to talk about uh, is not the most interesting of subjects. I apologize in advance. Um, it's kind of like talking about taxes, but it's all very important. Um, so I'll try to make it interesting, but it's also just know that it's got very important information. Take as many notes as you need. We're usually a small group, so feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, just know that if I tell you we might be covering that later, most likely I'll get to that question. Sometimes you guys want to go right to the details and skip the basics, and I'll start kind of and we'll get more in depth as we go um, because we'll, we'll build all that knowledge. Um, so financial aid is fairly, uh, it's actually fairly easy, but it's difficult. It's one of those complex, simple things. Um, and so we'll look at a few pieces of information, some of the basics behind financial aid, uh, some of the different programs that are out there, uh, both at the state and federal level, actually filling out and filing your FAFSA, and then kind of what's actually the hardest part of the college application process is actually what do we do once we get all the information back? Um, that's actually what I think you thought picking schools to apply to was difficult. The actual hardest part is actually picking from the schools you get into and then see their financial aid packages that they give you. That's actually the hardest part. So we'll talk um, some more in depth about that. Um, kind of for the camera and for you guys too, official disclaimer and uh, piece of information you guys need to keep in mind, I am not a financial professional. Okay, So please always check with your financial advisor, call the school's financial aid office, um, read everything that they give you, master promissory notes. Um, anything that they give you because this is this is intended as a general piece of information. This is not specific to any one family. Um, and information changes at any given time. So always double check your information, check your documents. And if you have any questions, always go to a true financial professional. Um, this I'm not one of those. Um, there may be questions that you have that maybe I don't have an answer to. Um, what I'll do is I'll write them down. Um, or if someone wants to jot them down uh, on a piece of paper, I'll collect them. And then when I send this out, I can also send out some updates of some information maybe I didn't have tonight that I can get you later. Okay. Um, also note that there are a few pieces of information on here that have not even been published yet um, in terms of like rates and stuff like that that we've seen last I checked. So there's still some forthcoming information regarding this. Um, basically, financial aid is a bunch of different money from different sources. All right, and it's how people typically are going to pay for college. So you have the free money, which is what we all want, uh, the scholarships and grants. When you see those two words, that means free, that means you don't have to pay it back. That is something you should almost always accept if you get offered it. The next one, the big L word that people hate, is loans. Okay, we'll talk about some of the different types of loans that should possibly be offered and some of the concerns and positives of both of those, all those programs. Um, and then work study. And those are kind of the big general four categories that you'll see a lot of financial aid. There's a few smaller niche ones that we'll show you in a little bit, uh, but those are the big four. And what work study is, because some people don't really know what that piece is, they all know what loans are, they know what scholarships are, and grants are for the most part. Work study is essentially a loosely guaranteed job in a pretty, pretty cush environment at school um, that, that is, is, is useful for students because many times you'll get, it'll be part of your financial aid package, they'll say you'll get $5,000 worth of work study. Um, and typically you get paid at a given rate in this job from any working minimum wage to even higher sometimes. Um, and typically students will get at minimum that $5,000 and that will go towards tuition, but you also want, you'll get more on top of that typically um, for kind of spending money as well. Um, but they'll, they'll guarantee at least 5,000. And it basically is you're working half for yourself, half for tuition for in, in a nutshell. Um, but it's usually very nice because it's also flexible around your schedule at school. You're not going to be working at Chili's until midnight and then have to get up for class the next morning at 6 o'clock. Um, so it's a nice gig if you're looking for a job. Um, but keep in mind, if they package that, that will be part of the finan total financial aid package that we'll show you guys later. Um, other uh, financial aid sources. Uh, one good one that a lot of people overlook uh, is actually the place that you work. Um, Many, job, many companies, employers, government agencies, private sector people have funds set up for employees or children of employees uh, to, to maybe help offset the cost of college. Um, I know, for example, Starbucks does that um, and other, other companies. Uh, a lot of times it's a little bit downside up here because a lot of times it's a bigger, usually kind of the bigger sized companies. Uh, but don't, don't uh, discount the mom and pop. All it takes is to ask the question. 
a lot of times it's you know, asking HR um, or someone, maybe your boss, and seeing if there's anything set up in, in where you work. Um, that's a great place for scholarships. The, apart from the federal government, a lot of the main aid that you're going to get is also straight from the school. Okay, so it's what we, what we call institutional aid. Um, and it could be institutional need-based aid, meaning how much money you earn. That's, that's the definition of need. Or merit. Merit-based aid is how good are you at something. Um, so how good, of, how good of an athlete are you? How good of a, a student are you? How good of a um, musician are you? Okay, all those things can, can qualify you possibly for merit-based aid. Um, there are private foundations that you can access. Um, Bill, G Bill McG Melinda Gates Foundation, all those types of things. Those typically will end up being scholarships. And then our local scholarships and regional scholarships and even national level scholarships. We'll talk a little bit more about scholarships in a minute. Um, and then things like Rotary or um, Rotaract and stuff like that sometimes have specific scholarships for an organization maybe you've volunteered with consistently. So those are all great places to check for the different levels of financial aid. Um, we talked about the, the two top ones, merit-based, so the, the how good are you, and the need-based, how much money do you not or do you make, um, and what kind of need do you have. Um, there are student and parent loans that you might get packaged in your financial aid award letter. Uh, work study, if, you're, if your family, or maybe you had served in the military at some point, there might be some options for you, um, or sometimes a dependent of someone who served in the military, so look into those options as well. Um, plus, if, if you're like in a service industry sometimes, you know, a lot of times like firefighters or police have some different um, sort of benefits that can that possibly pass on to their dependents as well. Um, and then savings. Family is a piece of this. All right? So it doesn't mean you have to have a bunch of money socked away, <coughs> but each year, and we'll look at what this means, but it's called EFC. That's what the FAFSA actually boils down to and calculates. Expected family contribution. And the federal government and the schools do expect each family to contribute at some level relevant to the amount of money they say uh, you make based on your tax information each year. So another p key piece of context, what we're talking about this year is done four times or more. Okay? And the numbers that we look at are all based on one year. All right, so multiply that by four or maybe even five. And that's kind of like if you wanted to look at a full college financial aid package, that's what that would look like. Um, so that's kind of like, in a nutshell, some of the basic types of financial aid. Some things to know about who qualifies for financial aid. You do have to be United States, at least at the federal level. It's a little different at the state level. Um, but at the federal level, when you're filling out the FAFSA, you do have to be a U.S. resident or a permanent citizen, typically meaning you have a Social Security card, and file taxes. Um, you do have to either be a high school graduate or working in your last year of high school uh, to apply, uh, be going into an eligible degree program. Um, most, degree, most degree programs that students are applying to here, because I've seen most of your applications are all totally eligible, so don't worry about that piece. Um, have social males, and I did get some information that might be changing in the future, but currently it's only males must register for the selective service. Okay, that's where you can do it online typically, or if you go to the post office, like when you register to vote, they typically will ask you to do that as well. The bottom one that's kind of cut off is satisfactory academic progress. And what that stands for, and that's typically not right now, but say as a sophomore, students have to maintain satisfactory academic progress as they're going through college. So say, for example, if they're put on academic probation, some of that could affect some of their financial aid. Um, they also have to typically be, to get their full package, they typically have to be enrolled at least half-time, whatever that definition of half-time is at that institution. Institutions are run on different settings, uh, you know, semester long that need 18 units versus quarters, you need 12, or whatever it might be. Okay, so whatever the institution you're enrolled at, whatever half time is, that is another process of uh, adequate progress towards your degree. So, financial need. So when we talk about financial aid, financial aid is what you're going to be getting at the end. But first, we have to determine what financial need you have. All right. And that's kind of the big equation. And the good thing is, there's not a ton of stuff that you guys can really do to affect this, at least at this point. Um, there's really not that much technically you can do within the legal world. Um, you can you know, maybe put some money in a specific account, a 529 or something like that. Um, but much of it is, unless you're 
you know, like moving to offshore accounts or something like that. It's not going to make that much of a difference. Most of it's anything you report on your taxes is going to go on to this form. Okay, so there's not a ton of stuff that you guys actually have to worry about in terms of like moving money around and that kind of thing. The big thing is just filling out the form and filling it out correctly. Um, everything else, the college actually does for you for the most part in terms of federal aid. So financial need is formulated, and we'll look more in depth at this when we break down this financial aid award letter towards the end. Um, but it's the cost of attendance. So every school that you guys are applying to has um, probably several different costs of attendances. One for an in-state student, one for an out-of-state student, one for you know, an international student, for example. Um, or a private school might just have one. They have one cost. They don't give in-state, out-of-state. Um, but they'll, they'll put together, year to year, an average cost of attendance for that year. The cost of attendance includes things like um, your full tuition, okay, um, room and board fees. Typically, if you're living on campus, that's, and sometimes if you choose to live off campus, they might ask you that, and that will factor in also to that calculation as well. Um, plus, reasonable living expenses. It usually includes um, some sort of small, um, we're not talking like MacBook Pro, like going and using your, you know, buying a $2,500 computer um, on your financial aid money. It's usually like 1100 bucks a year maybe. Um, and that's for things like travel, home, um, some car insurance, parking, you know, buying a shirt because you might need it, um, ramen noodles, that kind of thing. Um, so so it's, it, it, that is factored in. And the one thing to keep in mind, though, is it, it's a, they call it the cost of attendance, but it's an average cost of attendance. It's, it's what the, an average student at their school would expect. Okay? So one thing that sometimes are, is alarming for students is, especially if, so like when you're applying for financial aid, there's a whole broad spectrum of incomes that people are applying from. Okay? Average, sometimes, if you're on kind of the upper end of the spectrum, may be a pretty big shock okay? because the average is not going to be quite what you're expecting. Um, whereas, if you're on the other end of the spectrum, it might actually benefit you a little bit more because it's maybe above what you're expecting. Okay, but it's that average student. The other thing to keep in mind is if you're going across the country, part of that computation is not five flights <coughs> home every year. Okay, it's not um, you know, traveling to Europe and backpacking over the summer. That's not part of the financial aid package, <coughs> even though we wish it was. Um, so that's something else to keep in mind as well. Um, especially if you're going far away that's going to require travel. is Either you need to be willing to sacrifice traveling home for all the big holidays, or maybe pick one or two, or you need to budget into your package, um, maybe from your own pocket, money to put towards travel um, for family events and stuff like that. So you have the cost of attendance, and then the FAFSA spits out that number EFC. Okay, we'll look a little bit at that too. Um, but the cost of attendance minus your EFC equals your total financial need. All right. What the schools then do is they look at that financial need, they crunch it, and they say, okay, here is what we can do to get as close to your financial need as we can. Schools may or may not meet your financial need. Okay. And we'll compare a few examples of that as well. But that in a nutshell, that little banner is financial aid. Okay, pretty simple, right? Okay, it gets more intense um, and more in-depth. But uh, it, that's, if you look at that, that's just envision that. That's the process. Other than that, just forms. Um, a couple factors that influence your EFC, that expected family contribution. That at minimum is the number that your family is going to be expected and asked to pay for, um, for your college each year. So is a student independent or dependent? Almost every student in most cases is going to be dependent, unless you're a foster child sometimes, or you're emancipated, um, stuff like that. Okay. Every student here that I know of is, an, is a, de a dependent child. Um, the income, both students and parents. Okay, students, if you made an income um, over the summer and you filed taxes, that's kind of my cutoff. If you filed taxes on your income, if you made like 300 bucks doing some odd job or something like that and you didn't file taxes on that, I, I don't even bother reporting it. Okay? But if you filed taxes, the government has some sort of record that you did it, you need to put it on here. Okay? Um, same thing with your savings account. Typically, they're going to look for anything about over $6,000 is kind of the rough estimate. Uh, but they do. They they won't say like, oh yeah, six thousand. They usually use that as cutting off anything above that. They'll kind of factor into this equation as well. Uh, but the parents as well, your income obviously will be factored in. Um, this is where some of the specific to each family comes in, and I'll just mention uh, one thing that often gets asked. Uh, so we're divorced. My husband makes a million dollars. I make ten thousand dollars. Who do we report? The there's no official 
like legal requirement either way. However, what they suggest, um, so technically you can choose either one, um, but what the kind of like the ethical way to approach it is, whoever the student spends the most time with. So, so as long as you're not, don't have joint or uh, like separate custody, if you guys both have joint custody, whoever the student spends the most time with is who you should report. Um, but again, that's up to you as a family in deciding which one you want to report. There's not a legal term that's going to like come back and backfire by reporting the lower, the, the parent with the lower income on that piece. Uh, but if there's separate custody, like if there's only single custody, you need to report the person that has legal custody. Um, assets, that gets a little bit tricky because everyone's got a little different circumstance as well. However, um, typically the best, my kind of uh, frame of reference that I use is if I report it on my taxes, it'll probably play into something along this line, like my income tax. Because basically they're going to take the information straight from your income tax filing, what is that, 1040 or something like that, whatever form you use, um, and pull that, they actually, there's a tool, I'll show you guys where to, how it works in a second, but that will literally pull the information straight from the IRS and makes this process really easy. Um, so the number of, in college, so if you have more than one child in college, or if you will in the future, that does affect the amount of financial aid you get. Um, they're not unreasonable. They realize that college is expensive, and even though you might make $100,000, having two children in college versus one will require more money to be added and get more assistance with. Plus the number of family sites. They also realize that people at home are mouths to feed, people to take care of too. Okay, so that all factors in. They will ask that piece of information. Could you do that assets piece one more time? The yeah. asset? Yeah. So assets are very tricky. I don't have I don't have like a specific uh, circumstance, but typically if you're going to read, if it's part of your income tax, say for, uh, I'm trying to think of, of an example and I can't even think of a good one. Um, you have rental income prop rental income and it's playing into your, it's part of your income and you're reporting on your taxes. That's going to basically affect your bottom line at the end, right? Your adjusted gross income. That's the number that really impacts your EFC. Okay, so once you get your adjusted, that's going to go on here. And so if that, that, you know, if you have a property but it's all paid off and it's just kind of sitting, it's your secondary home, that's not necessarily going to come in. But if you're renting it out, for example, and you're bringing in $30,000 apart from your job on that income, that rental income, and it's, it gets reported, that likely will increase your EFC. So, if, if, on assets and savings, if they don't look at your home value and what... Uh, no, your home value... <clears throat> am I getting Excluded, ahead? federal, okay. <laughs> excluded. Family home, okay. okay, so where you live, okay. Um, if, you, if you, for some reason, have a farm in Tahoe, uh, good luck right now, but... Um, okay, that's all. Yeah. And then, like, your major retirement funds, 529s, 401ks, IRAs, and kind of thing. Okay. But everything else can be considered a part of that. All right. Um, any other questions before we head on? All right. Uh, I have one. Um, sure. Health savings account would also be considered an exemption, correct? Okay. Uh, I, I don't actually don't know about that. Okay. Uh, that would be something. A lot of, like some of those other accounts that I'm not super familiar with, uh, whether it fills in or not, um, that would be something. If you have some a different different account, maybe that. If you file your taxes, ask your tax person because mm -hmm. they might know more than me about your specific income requirements yep, and one accounts. Th one more thing before sure. uh, that two, two screens prior. Does the age of the parents have any impact on uh, no. eligibility? Okay. No. Unless like you're like possibly getting like social security and stuff like yeah. that. Like that might play into it. But you know, my parents are old. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's going <laughs> to affect your EFC or not. Um, but it could later, possibly in a couple, you know, three or four years if you're close to retirement or, or something how about like right that. Now? That might be um, a, a factor in. But I, I couldn't tell you one way, like how, how big of a factor. Okay. Um, all right. So some of the federal programs that we have. Um, so you have your Pell Grant. So these are all the free, this page um, basically is all free money, except for the work study, which is kind of free. You have to work for it, but it's, you don't have to pay it back later. Um, so the grants are always good. Most of these are going to be need-based, though. Okay, so it's going to be awarded based on your expected family contribution and how much there's like... They, each school has a little bit of a slight, kind of a sliding scale that they determine need based on their income. Um, so they haven't even set the uh, total maximum this year. This is one of the things that I mentioned that we don't even have the exact number yet for this year. Um, Pell Grants are something that are kind of like hot topic on like Capitol Hill right now because it's like people are like saying do away with them because they're too much money, but everyone's saying no, keep them. 
So word is they're keeping them, but they don't have a, like a maximum number of the award yet um, that I've seen. The last line of that piece is pretty important. Um, typically, and most students only do this if you're looking at a community college, um, you can only you typically only get grants at one school. So like sometimes people go into community college, um, say your, your English class fills up, sometimes they'll go drive 30 minutes and go to a different community college, and sometimes they'll take classes at multiple schools. Um, just keep in mind, any grants, you can only really use them at one school. You'll be awarded for one school. Loans might be different. Um, the typical community college is a little bit on the cheaper side, so it's not quite as uh, big of an impact. Uh, Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant. Um, that is, I don't even actually know what that is, but it's, um, it's a piece of uh, money that you don't have to pay back later, that essentially the schools will give you if you qualify based on need. Um, but it's a very specific, I think, qualification requirement that I don't know. Um, and then you get a work study, which we talked about earlier, that cushy job that you get to sit at the front desk of your dorm. Say hi to people and chill and watch TV or something. Um, okay, the not fun part of the federal program. Loans. So, loans are something, let me just preface it, loans are something that makes college possible for almost every student. Um, it's very rare for, for a family to necessarily pay full price, full ticket on everything regarding college. So, so I hear people say like, well, I'm not going to go to college until I save up enough money to pay for it all myself. Okay, well, most people, that's going to take years and years and years. And the lost income and earning potential from having that degree and getting a job that's for your degree or higher uh, with the requirement is, is much, much greater the earning potential is versus waiting and saving and having no debt. Um, the key thing about loans, though, is responsible borrowing. Okay, so that is the key piece. I said earlier this, at the morning meeting that um, if a student left uh, school with $100,000 in debt for their bachelor's degree, I would say they're crazy. Okay, I, you know, when you're looking at a bachelor's degree and, and you know you're looking at Harvard or Yale or something like that, for a bachelor's degree, the name of the school is not typically the most important thing at a bachelor's level. When you're looking at things like graduate school, medical programs, law school. Stuff like that, post second, like post post secondary, post baccalaureate. Um, that is where typically people are going to be more clamoring for some of those big name schools that you need to pay big big bucks for. Okay, if you left Harvard Law with a hundred fifty thousand dollar student loan bill, most likely, that's I mean people, certain firms only recruit at that certain school. You're going to get a job that's going to be much higher paying. So my advice to most students. I know that there's draw for some of those big name schools, and I'm not saying they're bad schools to go to, but it might not be worth some of the money if you got if your EFC is a certain kind of like side of the equation, and they can't fill your need. Um, it's usually not worth huge, huge debt that versus a different school that might be very much cheaper. Okay. Sometimes though, some of those schools might actually be cheaper than an in-state school based on your you know your performance if you have any type of special skills, things like that. Okay, so, so just keep that in mind. Um, leaving a bachelor's degree with $50,000, $75,000 in debt is a bad place to start a career. Um, it's not fun. It's a lot of money. And really, they want to, when people, when you graduate your bachelor's, employers really want to see that you can complete something, that you have the basic level skills. They're going to reteach you almost everything anyways, um, based on what that specific skill set you need is at that <coughs> employer. So try to keep the loans to a minimum, but they are, they are useful. Some people, for example, uh, you know, if you get a loan for four or five percent interest rate, and you have, even if you have the money to pay off the top, you know, if you invest that money, you might get an eight or nine percent turnaround. And you know what? You have on almost all these loans, um, except for unsubsidized. I'll talk about that. But if you if you take it out, you have six months after you graduate or become, stop becoming a full time student um, to pay it off, interest free. Interest doesn't kick in. Payments don't kick in. For unsubsidized loans for six months after you graduate. Subsidi or, sorry, back that up. Interest and payments don't kick in for subsidized loans until six months after you graduate. Unsubsidized loans are loans that um, you, the interest rate, as soon as you guys get that money dispersed, the interest starts accruing on that amount. Okay, so unsubsidized, the government actually pays your interest while you're in school. And that can continue from day one of bachelor's through you know, a master's degree, 
a doctoral degree, anything like that. So that might, you know, your $10,000 loan that's subsidized will still be a $10,000 loan when you graduate your PhD. Um, if you continue, as long as you're a full-time student through that whole process. Um, but just, you know, with that example of you might get, actually get a better return, and you can just put that money aside, earn more interest, and actually pay it off at the same rate, plus pocket some change if you invest wisely. So that's just one thing to think about. Um, so those are two, two loans. And one thing for you for your students, these are all things that are in your name. Okay? These two top two loans, at least, are the ones when you sign that note saying, yes, I will be your responsible borrower. Yes, I will pay this back. Yes, I know I'm accepting $50,000 in loans. It's not your mom. It's not your dad. It's you. Okay? Student loans are the hardest thing to get rid of. Bankruptcy, moving to another country, all those things do not dissolve your debt in student loans. Okay? It's one of the only things that bankruptcy doesn't actually dissolve. Um, the only thing it does is debt. Okay? <laughs> and sometimes it even passes off to your spouse. Okay? So it's usually debt dissolves it. <laughs> um, but it's something that, that typically you're not going to get away from. So being responsible, thinking ahead about how much you're really willing to incur, and then making a plan and sticking to it. The second two are called plus loans. And what plus means is parent. Okay, you're plus one on the loan package, yay. Um, but the plus loan actually goes into the parent's name. So parents, you might see this on there. Just know that those loans are loans that you are taking out. That means not paying back those loans does impact losing your house, losing your car, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so it's very important if parents, if you're not willing to take out that loan, um, that might be something that you have to figure out a different way to pay for it. Um, if that's, or maybe there's a different school that's for you if it's not going to work without that plus loan. I do believe, and I do have to, this is one thing I do have to check to make sure I'm telling you correctly, I do believe that the plus loans are credit based. So parents will have the credit checked to take out a plus loan. Um, and you can be denied a plus loan based on your credit as well. However, um, if, say for example, a parent is denied, typically the financial aid office will offer something similar or different. They might offer a a student loan, possibly, um, that's unsubsidized if you're denied by, like, without choice. Like, they're saying, no, we're not going to give you money. Um, and then the last one's federal Perkin loans, which where the school is actually the lender, not the federal government. Uh, but all of them act pretty much the same. There's different interest rates at each of them. Uh, most of the federal, the top two are set. They have a cap. They could be lower. So they do have, but they're all service, or they do have, like, competitive edge to it. So you can look around and look at it a little bit. Um, but they're all serviced by different companies, but back, they're all from, from the federal government. So you might have, a, one person might have um, Naviant, another person might have um, Mohela, or some other loaner, loan um, kind of servicer, that's what they call them, uh, to give you the money, but they're all from the federal government. Um, there are a few limits. This is last year, or this current academic year in college, if your student graduated last year, they do have maximums, so these are all loans. They don't package students with like $50,000 in loans in their freshman year usually because they know students are like, yes, I'm going to around the world trip. Um, but but they'll, they'll set a maximum. Keep in mind, the maximum is somewhat flexible. Okay, just like your entire financial aid packages. Um, the, the, the schools are not unreasonable in terms of possibly adjusting some of it. Okay, many times it takes some very... Con uh, very convincing um, arguments and reasoning behind it, but it's also um, something worth possibly pursuing if maybe your school is a couple thousand dollars out of reach. Um, but typically that's going to be a phone call to the financial aid office. They have what's called professional judgment, and that's where the financial aid officer can actually adjust this um, as they see available or fit. Um, so you can't really see this, but basically just what I wanted to show you guys was how the amount, the amount increases per year usually by about $1,000 to $2,000 um, as they go through school that they can actually borrow. In this federal, um, federal like subsidized and subsidized loan. Um, and then that bottom line is if you're possibly denied a plus loan, the, the loan amounts increase for the students that maybe their parent can't take out a plus loan. Um, so that kind of like is federal programs in a nutshell. That's kind of like the top of the umbrella. Next level down, and this is primarily uh, focused on California schools, uh, is the Cal Grant. That's the big one. 
Uh, the Cal Grant is an award that California awards California students when they go to California schools. Um, but basically what the Cal Grant is, um, there's three different levels. The top one is typically the first one that you'll see um, awarded if you're looking at like a CSU or a UC. Okay? Usually that top amount of about 12000 that might be actually a little bit more now. Um, I think this was 2014 or 15, 15 numbers. Um, the top one typically if you're like applying to a UC, you probably, and you have typically a 3.0 or above, um, you will be possibly qualified for up to $12,000. Okay? Um, that would be a $12,000 tuition discount, not a $12,000 check. Um, the second one, uh, I'm trying to remember this, um, I think the second one, if my, my memory serves, the second one is a, more of a need-based aid, and that can uh, fluctuate based on your income. Um, and I believe that one's still, I can't remember which one has a 2.0. Might be the B that has a 2.0, and then C has no GPA requirement. C is typically for your community college. Um, most of them have some level of need base to it, um, based on the amount you're going to get. And the amount of aid that you get from Cal Grant will also fluctuate based on which institution you enroll in. So UCs are typically going to get the most amount of Cal Grant. CSUs are going to get, a, you know, say UC gets about 12. CSUs are going to get about nine. Um, community colleges are going to get about three or four usually. Yeah. Is that a per year? Yes. So everything we're talking about is each year. Okay. So so cost of attendance is going to be each year. Amount you get awarded is going to be each year. Um, so that's a really good thing to keep in mind. This might be four or five years worth of this. Um, we already covered the second two. Last one is a teach program. Um, there's also questions of whether that's going to stick around or not um, by the time you guys graduate. Uh, but it's a program for people, if, you know, you can get some, there are some different programs out there that can essentially forgive loans later. Um, yes? Sorry, go back to the Cal Grants really briefly. Do those also apply to California private schools? Or yeah, so, let me see, do I have this up there? Might be on the next slide. Yes, so, um, University of California, private, many of the private schools, I can't promise every single one of them, um, but almost all of them. Uh, at some level. It might not be the full amount, um, but you typically can, can get qualified for them that, in that way. Um, that would be the independent colleges. And then career technical schools at some level as well. So that would be you know, your Universal Technical Institutes, um, Culinary Institute of America, that kind of thing. Um, and each of those are going to probably have a different award maximum that you can possibly qualify for at each level as well. And again, that's free money. You don't have to pay it back. Tuition discount. Um, you actually don't even have to apply for the calendar anymore. Um, we used to have to uh, collect all of your social security numbers, um, Blanca and I, and um, fight to get all you guys to turn them in and make sure they're correct and send them all in and all that stuff. This, the process is actually much simpler now. Um, later, in the, or probably in January-ish, we'll probably get a letter um, home saying, would you like to opt out of us submitting your information to the Cal Grant. You should not sign that form. Um, throw it away. Um, everyone should submit this, just like with the FAFSA. I highly suggest, even if you make $10 million a year, submit the FAFSA. Um, it, you might not get any need-based aid, but you can still qualify, a lot of schools use it to qualify you for merit-based aid, scholarships, um, low-cost loans. Even if you make a bunch of money, it doesn't mean you can necessarily afford to pay you know, a bunch of money every year for college. You can qualify for loans if they need it. Um, Another, another uh, resources and tools that you might need later. You never know what's going to happen in the next year or two. Um, so it's also a good backup plan. If you don't use it, no harm, no foul. You're not like using up your FAFSA years or something like that. Um, Does that feed into FAFSA though? I mean, do they use the information from FAFSA in order to qualify for a Cal Grant or you're just automatically qualified? Uh, no, you, so you have to fill out the FAFSA to qualify for Cal Grant. You do. Um, so it, I mean, it is a need base that we'll see that. Um, and it is packaged as part of your total financial aid package at the end as well. So it'll make up your financial aid piece. So it could impact on what you get from FAFSA if you get to go. It could, yeah. Okay. Um, again, so March 2nd, that's kind of your, your magic number, your magic date. <coughs> that is California's primary, or, uh, yeah, primary deadline, priority deadline for submitting your FAFSA each year. Uh, yes? I'm sorry if you covered this, I was a few minutes late, but do you have to submit the FAFSA every year or just Every year. 
So you can do it every year for every child that you have in college. Um, and uh, every year you're going to pick which um, your fan about your financial aid package. I'll get into the financial aid package, but you do get to choose what you take or don't take. It's not an all or nothing thing. thing. Um, but yeah, you'll fill out the FAFSA each year. Um, each year you'll get a new financial aid award. Um, and FAFSA opens on January 1st. FAFSA does open on January 1st. You do not go home and start it tonight. Um, you can, I'll tell you what you can start right now, but don't start filling out the FAFSA because it's not the right one. Um, January 1st is when that becomes available. Um, priority deadline for California, and I say California because each state has a different priority filing date. Some of them might be you know, February 1st or something like that. So if you're applying out of state, check, which, check your states, and I'll show you where you can find that, to find out if you're, any other states are earlier than March 2nd. Um, the nice thing is um, about some of that uh, is that you don't necessarily have, have to have all of your ducks in a row to submit your FAFSA before the March 2nd deadline, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Let me finish up with Cal Grants. Um, you can track it. There's a website. I'm not sending this out to students yet. Um, in January, I likely will um, because they'll forget everything over Christmas break. Um, I know you guys too well. Uh, but there's a website that they can log into and check the status of their, their Cal Grants. It'll tell and it'll tell you kind of like your estimated amount, if there's anything else that they're missing, or possibly why you didn't qualify. Um, it could be income levels are too high. Um, GPA not within the range, um, and stuff like that, not going to a California school, that kind of thing. Uh, other California aids, a, a lot of this is, is kind of like built in the package. You guys don't have really any, any control over what you guys get offered in terms of this stuff. Um, the big piece, and I'll have to change the name of this, but the UC systems. Um, so the UC has actually implemented a couple of new programs recently. One is the Blue and Gold Scholarship, um, and that's for, I don't have the exact numbers in my head, I have to look them up, um, but it's parents, families who make, um, I want to say it's up to like almost $100,000, somewhere um, what kind of would be considered like middle income um, would be qualified for that Blue and Gold Scholarship. And there's another one. Um, called the, the Middle Income Scholarship, which also is fairly similar that you can possibly be offered. Um, and essentially that, again, is a tuition discount, just like the Cal Grant, that they're lowering your tuition because your family shows that you need it. Uh, but all this stuff, again, by filling out your FAFSA, that is a determination of whether you will get offered this or not. Um, we don't, it's kind of like, look at that. Um, all right, so... Kind of like that's brief overview, and well, maybe not so brief um, overview about what financial aid looks like, some of the different options you might get in that award letter. Now we're going to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of like, okay, how do we apply? What do we do after we apply? What does it look like when I get an award letter? How do I make decisions? That's kind of like the more interesting piece too. Um, so for the federal aid, the the one way to do that is FAFSA. Um, the exception that I should note um, is there's about 300. Um, schools across the country, very small amount in comparison to all the schools, um, and typically they're going to be your, your most selective and most, excuse me, expensive schools uh, that also require a supplemental financial aid application called the CSS profile. Okay. The CSS profile is like, so the FAFSA um, is like, you know, if you're buying a house, the FAFSA is your drive-by. There you go, that looks good. All right, so that's the FAFSA. The CSS profile is like the inspector coming out, getting under the house, looking at the wiring, checking the pipes. Okay, that is the CSS profile. It is a much, much more in-depth look at your financial situation. Um, it sounds scary, but it's actually, from what they tell us, it might not necessarily always work like this, but what the schools tell us that use this profile, um, it is a tool to actually award you more aid not try to get more money out of you. Um, so they try to actually qualify you as best they can, and that's why it's usually the most selective and most pricey, because they, they do want people to pay full price that can, but you know, $50,000 a year, even if you're making $250,000, is not a small chunk of change. Um, so they actually look at it, and they do consider it much more in-depth. Um, pieces of information, they look at all of your properties. If your family's divorced, they look at you know both sets of parents, even if you are divorced, because someone's probably paying child support. A lot, lot more information. But we don't cover it in depth because it's usually like 10% of a class or less possibly would even need to fill it out. 
Um, so if that's you and you have some questions, I'm happy to help you with that individually. Uh, but it's not something you usually do a presentation on. The, piece, the reason why I mention it um, is because many times it has a much earlier deadline. All right, so it's not like March 2nd when schools are looking for this. Um, it might be as early as now, um, especially if you did like an early decision or early action um, college application. So if you just look up CSS profile, um, it's through the college board. So that's the program that offers it. So like when you signed up for your SATs, you'll sign up through the same account and log in and fill that out. Um, one tip, if you guys don't know if you need to do CSS profile, the easiest way to look is go to Google. CSS profile schools. First link that pops up is going to have the list of probably 300 schools that you'll be able to check. Yeah. I was just make a note for anybody else in here because I've already filled it out. Don't be surprised by it, but it does cost money compared yep. to the FAFSA. It's $16 to send to each school plus $9 to register. Oh Where's the FAFSA is free. Yep. So just make a note of that when you're doing it. Don't get all shocked at the end because it does cost money like everything from the College Board. Yep, College Board is <laughs> the most expensive nonprofit out there. <laughs> <laughs> So the FAFSA, again, free is the key word, thank you. Um, you know, you should never pay any money to file your FAFSA. Um, you can pay people to help you, you know, get your finances in order, that kind of thing, but you should never pay anybody, you don't have to pay any fees to like submit your FAFSA. If you're doing that, you're in the wrong site, you're probably sending it for a scam and you're about to get a bunch of junk mail and people hacking your accounts and stuff like that. So free is always key. Uh, FAFSA.gov, or you can also go to FAFSA.ed.gov, but both take you to the same place. Those are the two official. Do not go to FAFSA.com. <laughs> state aid, again, most of, most of the state aid is, again, awarded through the FAFSA. FAFSA is an overarching requirement. School aid, again, most of the school aid is also awarded by the FAFSA, but you might have that supplemental requirement of the CSS profile. Um, and then scholarships, each scholarship provider is going to have their own application. So that's, that's kind of the process. So... Um, when we're looking at filling out the FAFSA, this is the screen that you'll probably somewhat look like. It might be changed by now um, a little bit, but it looks very similar. So the first place that you're probably going to go is start a FAFSA, which is great. You can do that. Um, but actually, one, the first step that I would suggest doing, and this is, this is the one thing that you can technically start now, um, is get your FSA ID. Some of the information you might have, or if you have older children, um, that used to be called a PIN. So your PIN, and that, that, that is essentially your electronic signature that you sign all of your documents with. Uh, that's what you sign your FAFSA, your promissory notes, that kind of thing. You should protect it like your social security number. Um, if they get that, it can go into, into your FAFSA, pull out all of your important data, socials, all that stuff, and have access to it. So just protect that log and information. So that's up here, the third icon over the little lock. You can go there and start that today. Um, Starting on January 1st, you can come down here and click Start a New FAFSA. Okay, it's going to walk you through the process. They've actually, believe it or not, made it pretty simple. Um, it's basically like filing a very, very, very basic tax form. Okay, as long as you have the right information in front of you, it's literally say, look at line 46, put line, line 46 here, and then it's crossing over. Um, and everything else is, there's a lot of really, um, on the sidebar, there's notes about each line, you can chat and call, I'll show you how to do that later. Their help system is actually really good. If there's pe real people that are gonna answer um, and, and talk to you about any questions that you have regarding filing your FAFSA. Once you've started your FAFSA, anytime you need to come back, once you started it, you need to use this right-hand side, and there you can make corrections, add schools, and that kind of thing, all right? If, um, if you're applying out of state, you can click to this link here. It'll show you deadlines for other states for filing your FAFSA. Um, but that in a nutshell is essentially the basics of this website. Once you click that green link, it'll walk you through the process. I don't have a page up here for each step of the way. Um, but most people I find don't actually have trouble filling things out. It's just really important to read all the instructions. Okay, it's not something that you just like see this whole line of text and be like, oh, I see my name, fill in your name. You might miss something that says fill in your student's name and you fill in your name. Okay, so just make sure you read all the instructions fully. And if you have questions, you can fill it out to move on to the next page. Just remember, make a note, come back to it later. Um, I don't know if it'll let you skip with something not filled in correctly or not. This is what it looks like if you're checking other dates, or I'm sorry, other dates in other states. You can just select the state and it's gonna select your filing term. It's going to give information about that, so if you're applying out of state anywhere, you might want to check that uh, page out. 
what you're going to need to file your FAFSA. So you're going to need your social security number. And make sure it's accurate. Um, recent federal income tax returns, W-2s, and any records of any other money that you've earned. Um, so, so some people say, well, my taxes are not going to be done by March 2nd. There's no way that's going to happen. Um, that's okay. Okay, but it's, it will make the process a little bit longer. But you can file a FAFSA. You can submit it. And what that does, you know, you can submit on January 5th, and you'll use either a prior year's estimate or your tax return from the prior year if it's relatively same year to year. Or do your best to estimate your, your, what your income tax return might look like at the end of this, you know, for this 2015 school year. And enter that as an estimate. When you're entering those numbers, there's a box that says this is my actual or this is my estimate. Okay, if you enter the estimate, what that does when you hit submit, it basically acts as a placeholder. Okay, it says this student submitted on January 5th at 11.59 p.m. and 30 seconds. Um, and the good thing about that and what people sometimes you'll hear is you want to submit as soon as you can. To a certain level, that's true. Um, I wouldn't rush it and make mistakes, but submitting <laughs> earlier rather than later is better. The reason being, some of these schools, especially private schools, have these pots of money that sit around, but they're finite. Okay, and typically dispersed on a first come, first served need basis. Okay, so so they have a hundred thousand dollars they're giving away to needy students, and you know if you submitted maybe in January, you would have been in that pot. If you submitted in end of February, that pot's gone already. You no longer qualify for that. So that's kind of the benefit of submitting early and possibly using an estimate. Okay. The big thing about that is you have to remember to go back in after you've filed your taxes and actually correct it and make it accurate. Because they won't, schools won't process your aid unless you correct that information. Any questions about that? That's sometimes a little confusing. So, well, I just want to make sure they'll, they'll award you aid based on an estimate, but they won't actually give it to you until so, you finalize no. your income tax. So they will not award you aid based on an estimate. So, you can submit your FAFSA, and it will likely give you an EFC based on your estimate. Um, but that num the schools, when you submit your FAFSA, um, I liken it to, if your students know, submitting your UC application. Okay, That's in its own separate system. Once you hit submit, it goes to each individual school. So it's no longer a FAFSA thing. So if you submit an estimate, basically the FAFSA holds your spot in line, but nothing gets sent to the schools until you update it. Does that make sense? So they're gonna they're gonna say yes, you've submitted. Here's your here's what you th we think your EFC is gonna be based on that estimate. Um, but until you go back and correct it, that's still sitting there, waiting to go out to the schools. So that pot of money that's available, let's say only in January, if you if you submit in January, you submit it in January. You're in that pot. But if you only submit your estimated, in you're January. in that pot. You no. can make corrections anytime oh, you need okay, to. Okay, that was my question. Yes. So so that's why you submit with an estimate. That's why, otherwise, why would you do that? Just wait. But no, you want to submit with an estimate if you, if you don't have that done. If you can finish your taxes, get it all done in one go. Makes it so much easier. But, yeah. You, you um, referenced the private schools, how those finite pots of money. What about the state schools? And the state schools, you see less of it. Uh, most of those finite pots of money are sometimes like need-based uh, institutional aid, um, whereas you don't see quite as much of that at state schools. State school uh, tuition is typically, I mean, comparatively, not, I mean, it's not low, but it's comparatively low. Um, and state schools are very limited in terms of what they can and can't offer by the state government. So, so much of the, like, the pots of money that you'll be thinking about at the state level is going to be your Cal Grant. It's going to be some of those other grants that you might get awarded, but it's not necessarily a time-based thing. As long as you submit by March 2nd, the priority deadline, you can qualify for the based um, requirements of that for that Cal Grant and all your GPAs in order. But you, you don't typically see a lot of, like, those pots of money at that at the, the state schools, but still a good idea to submit early, just in case things change. Um, bank statements, records, basically any, all your information about the last year. Um, and we, are, we this year we will be referencing 2015. Okay, and one important note: um, there are some changes happening next year. Um, yes, I know, lots of changes. You guys are the year of changes. Um, so next year, so. Please make a very mental big note, this is not this year. This year, January 1st, everything's the same, 2015, business as usual. However, next year, just so you have it in the back of your head, because you might not have someone like me coming and telling you this. Um, it would be up to your children. 
it's just, I don't know. <laughs> that might be hit or miss. Good luck. <laughs> Um, next year, in, at, when your student is, a, is going to be a sophomore in college, there are two big changes that we know of so far. Number one, they will be using 2015 again. What? <laughs> okay, so they will be using 2015 twice. Okay, so you're going to use it for this year you're submitting, you're going to be using it for next year as well. The big reason is they are, they are making it easier for students to submit. Um, actually, it, it's a good change, but it's kind of sucks for this year. Just because if you had a great year, it's going to be bad. If you had a horrible year, it's actually be good for your financial aid because it's two years in a row that you had a bad year versus a good year. Okay, but depending on which, which boat you're in, it could either be really good or really bad. So you're um, saying they rely on the information that you submit for 2015. They rely on that same Your tax return that you use for 2015, again. they will do that twice. Again, on, on sophomore year. Correct. Okay. Um, so that's one big change. So they'll use that year to, to calculate financial aid again. The second change is when you start filing. Okay, August 1st will be the next, so next August, after you've graduated, actually are a freshman in college, you will start filing the FAFSA again. So they're basically changing the year, and then after that year, everything keeps moving forward. But they're, they're making it different, so you don't have to wait and like, oh, my tax is done, or my tax is done, or my tax is done. You already have your tax return ready to go. The reason they do that is they want to get the students the information about their financial aid package sooner so they have longer to make a better decision. Because right now, in, a real, in reality, you have about April. That's about it. Because you're going to get information from most of your schools in about March. It takes about two weeks to get that information back um, with your financial aid package. Then you have about a month before May 1st to make a decision about which school is the best for you. So they're trying to extend that time you have to make a decision mm -hmm. to have you guys have more options and better choices. So it's a good idea, and it's a great process, it's just going to be a little tricky for you guys. Um, so just keep that in the back of your noggin for next year, like it's going to change a little bit, but not too, too much. Every, the rest of the process should be very fairly similar, I believe. So we'll fly in January and again in August? Yes. 2016. Yes. So. All right. And again, the FSA ID. Uh, which is that pin, replace the pin, that, that again will be your electronic signature, so again, keep that somewhere safe. You and a parent and a student will need an FSA ID, okay? And you guys will need to remember it each time you need to go back and sign it, so once a year at least. All right, so keep it somewhere safe, you and the student. Your iPhone is not safe. <laughs> I know all you guys keep your stuff on your iPhones. Um, so this one, this is where you'll create your FSA ID. Um, kind of skip through a little bit of this because I want to kind of get to the award letter before we're done. Um, if you guys need help, this just um, they do have a very good FAQ section, and believe it or not, they actually have pretty good questions that people ask. And they have answers to answer them. So if you get stuck, stumped, don't know what to do next, start there. Don't in a panic call me and say I don't know what to do. Because most likely I'll say, did you check the FAQ? Uh, if you didn't. Um, that's the first place to look. They have a lot of really good stuff. The second place is actually to get up to get on the phone because most of the stuff, unless it's fairly basic, and you can bring in your computer and show me, um, I can't really probably help you over the phone with it. Um, so it's something that we'd have to sit down and look at, and I can probably figure it out. Um, but these guys are actually, like I said, really good. You can chat with them on a computer, you can phone call them, you can email them, and they're pretty responsive and have a pretty broad set of hours. They're open until 11 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. So I mean, it's fairly flexible for students over here to to get in contact with them later at night. All right. Uh, there's a worksheet that you can fill out if you want to um, ahead of time, uh, just to kind of get an idea and get stuff in order, so you can kind of start working on it now. If you're kind of like a type A person and go getter, um, but really most of the stuff is pretty simple. The last thing um, is that magic button that will automatically pull up your information from the IRS. This typically is only available to you if you've already submitted your taxes. Um, so next year it's going to be magic because you guys already will. Uh, but this year it kind of gets a little tricky. If you've submitted it, you can use this. Um, and they may have actually changed this, so you might get a little bit different once you actually get to this point. But from what, I, what I've heard in the past, if, you've submitted an, if you're having to submit an estimate, you can't use this button. And many times if you do that, you can't go back and do it later. Okay, so that's the big difference. Um, but if you already have your tax information, if you're not like in a rush, you can use this and it literally pulls all the right information that it needs in terms of monetary information. Pre-populates all your forms and goes forward. So it takes it straight from the IRS, connects it straight over. Um, so that professional judgment, again, 
People lose their jobs. You know, financial circumstances change. Um, family circumstances change. Additions, subtractions. Um, all that kind of stuff happens without ex ex expecting them. And so just know that when you get your financial aid package back, you're not necessarily set in stone. They're, they, you can call, you can't, I, I hesitate to use the word negotiate, so that you're not really like negotiating your salary, like, oh, this person wants me, this person wants me even more, what can you do to make this one better? Like, they're not gonna play that game, okay? They're gonna say, that's not how it works. Here's what we're gonna give you, unless you have a specific need, you can go over there, that's fine with us. Um, but really, it's gonna be more of a conversation of, you know, my finances are not the same as what I, what was reported in the FAFSA as of last year. There's a very significant change in our income. You know, we no longer, we might qualify for other things. You can ask them to consider the circumstances, but typically they'll consider them once, and once they make a decision, it's final. So there's not going to be like a series of revivals and, you know, going back to them. So make sure you have all your stuff in order, and make sure you know what you want to ask for when you call them. But you can call them and talk to the financial aid department. Most of them are very nice people. They want to help. Um, just keep in mind, many times they are, their hands are tied in certain areas, but they, they're going to help wherever they can. But just know that, like, if you get a letter, that's not the only option that's available. Last thing about the FAFSA, and we'll talk about the award letter. Um, print this. Okay, this is your confirmation page, just like with your applications. You want to be able to prove if something goes wrong that you submitted, that everything's in, that you submitted at a certain time, um, because stuff breaks, even at the federal government level, believe it or not. Um, these computers go down, servers crash, they get wiped because there's a virus, I don't know. But you want to be able to print this. There's also a couple of key pieces of information on here. At the top is the first one, it's a confirmation number, and then there's a data release number. Sometimes you'll see it as a DRN. You'll need to reference that number anytime you try to call or chat with someone about your FAFSA, even at the financial aid office typically. So that's going to release information, help it connect it to you. So keep that number handy. Um, you can go back in and print this later, but it's just nice to print it right away. Um, down below that, it's going to give you your estimated family contribution. So it'll spit out that number that you're looking for. Um, that's just num a good number to have when you're planning and thinking ahead. On the right-hand side of that, it's going to give you your estimated grants and um, loans. Excuse me, loan amounts that you might qualify for as well. As well as some information. They think college rates and graduation rates are important for people to know. So they'll include it on schools that you list in your application. And you will list your schools that you're applying to on the FAFSA. Um, list all of them. You don't need to know whether you're not, you've got in or not. If you don't get in, they won't get it. If you do get in you don't go there, they don't care. It just disappears after a while. Okay, so if you, if you, they're going to make your financial aid award letter. If you choose someone else, their feelings aren't hurt. You know, they, you know, they're not going to like cry in the corner because you didn't come. They're going to move on to next year and go on and go forward. Okay, so just add them. There's not necessarily even, you'll, you'll read all these different things about like, oh, the order of the matter. Um, the only thing that matters in the order is I would suggest putting your top schools in the, if you have more than 10, you, there's 10 spots to enter schools um, when you first submit. Enter kind of like your top choice 10. They don't have to be in a specific hierarchical, hierarchical order or alphabetical or anything like that. But your top 10, the main reason is because many times those schools will get sent out first then you have to go back in and add schools later. Those other schools that you added afterwards may take a little bit longer to process your your FAFSA because it might take that they might be the next batch they send out or something. So that's just the other the one tip that I've heard that sometimes can help it go quicker. Um, and then at the bottom, if you have other students, so there's also an option to transfer the information to another student. So you don't have to refill out everything. You just have to change the student information typically, but your information will stay the same. All right, so what do we do with all that? All that garbage we've got done to paperwork. So you are gonna get a student aid report um, in a couple days usually. And that'll have some more detailed information about your possible aid. Um, but then the FAFSA will then also send out um, through your, I think it's the ISIR, yeah. Um, that's a system that they connect with this information each school. They'll get your information in either immediately in a batch day every week or every other week or something like that. And they'll receive that and their job is to then prepare your financial aid package. That usually takes them anywhere between 10 days, possibly even three weeks at the longest. Um, and then they'll send that out to you usually in the email and, and in the U.S. Postal Service. All right, so it's very important to list your accurate mailing addresses and stuff like that. Um, 
sometimes, in case there's any question and, or in case you're selected for uh, verification, um, they might ask for additional documents. So they randomly select at different levels in different states um, random students to go through with the process called verification. And verification basically just matches up your documents that you submitted to all your W-2s and that kind of stuff with what you submitted to um, the FAFSA to verify you know, essentially everything is on the up and up. So that's one big reason why. And, and they do that every year and people do get selected and you do have to submit it um, or else you won't get qualified. Um, so just another reason to be up and up on these pieces of information. They already have it, they just want to make sure. Um, all right, so if you guys have this, so this packet here, just has some information on here, just light reading, um, in case you want to look through a few pieces of information about um, different loans and some uh, the other stuff in case you forget it after we leave. Um, but we're going to talk about this other piece of information. If you didn't get, there's a few more over here if you want one. Um, so this is an example, and everyone, every school might look a little bit different. This is an example of a uh, financial aid award letter, all right? And they'll, most of them will have fairly typical pieces of information on them. At the top, you usually have some instru instructions, maybe an introduction paragraph. Oh, thank you for coming to CSU Chico. Here's some information about how you're going to pay for school, blah, 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 blah. Still read it, even though it sounds kind of generic, because it might have information like, in 30 days, you must, blah, blah, blah. If you skip over that, you might not realize that there's a deadline coming up. Um, but usually you'll have, the first thing you'll see is usually a cost of attendance. That's that thing that we talked about at the beginning. Your tuition, your room board, your reasonable fees at the average level. Okay, so that's going to be your cost of attendance. It's a very important number, um, and I'll show you why in just a second. Down below is, and they'll, they'll present it different ways. Sometimes what I most typically actually see is the full year in just one um, aid. They'll give you a financial aid package for the full year. Some schools, like this example, break it down by semester or term um, that they'll be granting you with a full amount at the end. Um, but they will list uh, all the different financial aid options that they're giving you. Or offering to you. Um, a piece of note when you're looking at this, you do not have to accept all of this. Okay? If you, you should, which one should you select for sure? Free. Yeah, free money, Pell Grant. Okay? You see Grant, accept it. Um, okay, but down below that, uh, you know, you don't necessarily need to select the loans if you don't want to take them out, but they build them into your package. Um, so, so you can also select a portion of one of the loans, but maybe not the other half. So if you only wanted half of the subsidized loan, you could do that as well. Um, sometimes that would require, they're, depending on which school you go to, they're going to have a little bit different system um, where you actually probably will go online after you get this to accept your award um, through like a portal, My Cal Poly, My Boston College, whatever. Um, and they'll usually do a couple ways. You can accept the entire thing, you can select which ones you want, um, sometimes they don't give you the option to select only a partial of it. If that's the case, you need to probably call the financial aid office and say, you know, thank you for offering me the award. Um, you know, my family would only, we'd like to accept the following awards, but we'd only like to uh, accept $2,500 of the $5,000 loan, of the unsubsidized loan that, you, that you're offering to me. And they will go back and update that award. Okay, so if you don't see the ability, the option of, to select a part of um, your award, just give them a call. Um, and then at the bottom, there's a bunch of information about what you need to do next. Okay, that's the typical breakdown of um, what it looks like for a financial aid award letter. Pretty straightforward, usually can fit on one piece of paper. Some of, my, some of them might be fancy and colorful with graphs and bar charts and stuff like that, but those are the two key pieces of information. Okay, and the reason is, here's what you're gonna be doing. What I suggest students do, and I'm gonna write up here so I'm gonna be a teacher for a little bit. Um, what you're going to be doing when you get them. This is where it gets hard. This is actually the hardest part. Um, so you're going to probably have, so this first you're going to break it down. You're going to get probably two letters or emails. You're going to get your acceptance letters and emails. Uh, yeah, you're in. And then you're going to get your financial aid package accept, you know, letters or emails. Okay, so you're gonna, but you're going to break, make two piles. Your first one, and you're going to rank these, is going to be your admits. By the way, you won't get any financial aid offers for schools you don't get into, so you don't have to worry about that. They won't just—they just won't appear. Um, 
So you're going to say you get admitted to four schools. So you're going to have letter one, letter two, letter three, and letter four. All right? And you're going to put those in order of which school is your top choice, second choice, third choice, fourth choice. Okay? Based on the school itself, ignoring, ignoring money at this point. All right? So which one do you think you would most likely accept? So you're going to have number one, two, three, four. Um, then what you're going to do is you're going to make a money pile. Okay, you're going to get your financial aid packages. And you're going to match them together. Okay, so you're going to see what your number one is. What I want you to do at that point is, this might, parents might take you kind of helping out here. It's probably going to be a little challenging for students. But looking, and I'm happy to help with this too. Um, looking at these two, and looking at the financial feasibility of each of these, ignoring that top rank. So strictly looking at finances, which one is the most financially attractive or feasible for you as a family and as a student? Okay. So it might be one, four, three, two. All right. Those don't line up. Okay. So this is where the hard part comes in. Is you have to determine as a family and more importantly as a student. Because remember, whose name is this money going into? Let's see it goes. Um, you have to determine, say the difference is, so this one, um, actually, let me kind of explain something else first before I continue with my example. So, when you are looking at a financial aid award, there is the likelihood at maybe one or more of your schools, you'll have what's called uh, unmet need or gap in your financial aid, okay? So what I mean by that is, using this example of this big student, we'll use round numbers, so their cost of attendance equals $20,000, all right? Um, we'll, use, we'll say their EFC, that expected family contribution, that first number right off the bat, we'll say it's 5,000. And it could be anything, it could be zero, but 5,000 for the sake of the example. Okay, so remember the formula, this minus this equals 15,000, and that's your financial need. Okay, so that's that number that schools are going to try to match and fill. All right, so say they are, they're going to do this. They're going to say, okay, to meet your financial need, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you a um, $2,000 grant. Um, you know, a three thousand work study for three thousand um, dollars, and we're going to package you with a loan of five thousand. Okay, likely to be more than this, but this for the example to give you the example of what unmet need is. So when you add all that up, that's ten thousand dollars. Okay, if you take this and subtract it. Like a math teacher right now, uh, that gives you negative five thousand dollars. That is unmet need. That is a gap. Okay. So what that means, what it, having a gap means, is your family or you, the student, if you want to go to that school, you need to come up with five thousand dollars for that year, in addition to taking out that loan. Okay. So that is the piece that 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 is a huge calculation that you'll be looking for in each of these. Okay. Moving back to this example, say that this is that example there with the um, cost of attendance being, or we'll just say the gap equaling 5,000. Okay, but perhaps this school, maybe they either cost less money and to start with the cost of attendance is lower, or maybe they added, you know, maybe instead of this, maybe they said, well, we're going to give you. Um, we're going to give you a $10,000 merit scholarship. Whatever. That's gone. And that, you probably actually even, you might not even, you probably wouldn't even need to necessarily take this out. Like you might even get that. You might not need the loan now. Okay? So, because it's lower or they offer you more, this gap equals zero. 
Okay, so that's a calculation that you have to run through with each of these schools and figure out, okay, how is this going to be possible with what we want to do? And then as a family, you have to figure out, is going to my number one school academically, choice-wise, location-wise, really worth $5,000 a year to me? Or is number three really all that bad? Can I, can I survive, can I, can I, it's not settling, all these should be your first choice schools. Obviously there's going to be a, you're going to have better, like, you'd rather go to one or the other. But will I be happy going to number three? Some families would say, we're going there. Okay? Other people would say, we're going here. And, and there's a lot of different factors that play into that. Money can't be the only thing, because guess what? You could go here, you could hate it, and guess what? You just wasted a bunch of money. You just took out a five, you know, maybe a five thousand dollar loan, and a year of your life, um, possibly, and really you're planning on transferring somewhere else now, and maybe half of your credits end up transferring. Okay, so there's a lot of factors to weigh in, and I'm not saying it's an easy process, um, but in terms of making you know, making some decisions, you're really kind of making two: your kind of like livelihood and academics uh, decision, and your financial decision. But you have to make a mesh somehow. And there's not really a great, a super great system to figure it out. This is one that I suggest just because it can help you to really put it in order and see what the impact is going to be on both sides. Okay. Do you guys have any questions about this process? All right. Teaching done. Um, so, so that that in a nutshell is what these award letters are for. They're going to give you the information you need to kind of compare and contrast and shop. Once you get all of your stuff back. You might get one back and be like, oh, that's awesome, they're my first choice school. Wait. Don't put all your eggs in one basket yet. See what else you get. Make a full decision based on all of your admissions, based on all your financial aid packages. Because, who knows, you might have zero here, but you maybe include a loan into your first choice school. But you might get, like, full scholarship here, or something along those lines, and you already made your deposit somewhere else uh, because you jumped the gun a little bit. The big, the big kind of date that you have to worry about is May 1st. That's the national decision day when most schools are going to accept, um, expect a typically electronic letter of intent to enroll in the fall plus a deposit of some level. All right, it could be $500, it could be $75, I don't know. Um, but again, that is essentially once you do this and you've accepted and you accept your award, at the end of this you're going to go online to the portal, accept all pieces, um, portions of the award that they're offering or negotiate and call. Um, many times you'll have to go through, if you're taking out loans, you'll sign a master promissory note, which is a big legal document that every, you should read, your child should read, and then you should probably read it one more time. Um, you'll sign that, because that is that legal document that you'll take to court and say, I didn't know I was, uh, yeah, you did, you mm -hmm. signed it. Um, as well as usually going through um, some sort of loan counseling for the student. The loan line will do a loan counseling program on their computer. Um, after that, once you submitted that, your funds will then be dispersed whenever they have it set up to disperse at the college um, to pay for tuition and that kind of thing. And you're on your own, you're on your way. And then the process starts all over again the next year. So this doesn't come out until after you filled out FAFSA? Correct. So you'll get this after you've submitted your FAFSA and after, you get your, after you've gotten admissions notice. Any, I don't know if there's much else after this. Any other questions? Um, let me see if there's anything. There's just a few additional resources, some websites and stuff, but most of it's all on the, that main website. Um, Studentaid.gov is another good one. Um, but yeah, it's, like I said, it's a very complex, but it's very straightforward. There's not a whole bunch that you can do. It's just making sure that you fill it out and then being informed about making a decision. Um, so you have some time to do it, so don't feel like you're super rushed. Um, but it is something important to think about, to start planning for making that decision, and having a conversation as a family. Um, you know, parents, again, it's in their name for the most part, but you guys are the voice of reason a lot of times. This is one area, I, I'm all for students kind of like taking lead in applications and stuff like that. This is one area that I do suggest having some input, okay, and, and having, being, leading some of that conversation about your experience with the finances of the past. Um, some, you know, most of them haven't taken out a loan, like that kind of stuff. So they don't, the, the, the concept is kind of like foreign to some of them. They don't understand some of the impact and relevance and, um, well, they understand what it means in the long term. Um, having a, a good down to conversation about what that looks like and what you as a family are willing to contribute and being very clear. It's not something that you should lie about. 
like, oh yeah, we'll pay for it, honey, don't worry. And you get the bill, and it's like, no, we're not paying for it, honey. We're going to community college. Um, that is how you have very angry children at the end of the year. Um, so being open and honest so that they know what to look for. And hopefully you've had that conversation so they know where to also apply, um, because that's also a consideration as well. But at least now, knowing where what is a reality and what the expectation of what might be coming from mom and dad or grandma and grandpa and stuff like that. Okay? Any final questions? Yes? Is there a resource for finding uh, a listing of grants and scholarships? Mm, scholarships, good point. I forgot to mention that. Uh, grants, again, you're not going to, most grants you're not going to like need to apply for. Grants are stuff that are awarded to you. Scholarships are typically things that you will usually apply for at the local, regional, national level. Um, here, here at campus, um, most, to be honest, most of the students get local and regional scholarships. You can apply to your heart's content to the Dr. Pepper, McDonald's scholarship and go to the Super Bowl and that kind of thing, win a million bucks. But all that is is a marketing campaign that you're going to get signed up for junk mail and phone calls. Um, the likelihood of you getting that award is infinitesimally small. Um, so what the biggest return on time and energy and privacy um, is going to be our local and regional scholarships. A um, couple places that I cut, most of those actually come through my office that are kind of targeted towards our students. There are, you know, there are other ways um, that students can find it, but most of the big ones that students actually get, they send to us. Um, so two places that I typically post those. One is in the office in a paper format. There's a big blue bulletin board right across from Cindy's desk. I'll post them up there. Students are welcome to come down, take them and make a copy and stick it back up. Um, I also post it on their Noviance account in an electronic format. So they can, it's under the college tab at the bottom. It says um, financial, or uh, sorry, scholarship, scholarship links or scholarships. I forget what the exact wording is. Um, but it has all the scholarships I have in to date. Um, for example, there's one up there already. Our big local, we have three big local ones that you should all be aware of. Um, they're, and they're all three applications, but they all have multiple awards underneath each of them. So you can fill out three and have like dozens of applications you possibly might qualify for. The one that's currently out is the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation. That one has up to a $40,000 scholarship in there for basically our local area. The Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation, um, that's up there already. Your students, I believe, also have it in their email inbox. I think I sent that one out already. Um, <coughs> in January, we'll also probably run it into your Pathways class as well. All our local ones, we make sure that they have multiple opportunities to get it in their hands. They don't have any excuses. Um, the other two are the Tahoe Mountain Resorts Foundation. That also typically carries a big one, like $8,000, $10,000 a year over four years as well. And then we have um, one at, uh, called the Tahoe Truckee Community Scholarship Committee, which they did a wonderful job naming them, because um, we have two that sound exactly the same, and I was so confused my first year, <laughs> because I said, we already got that one. And they, they said, no, you didn't. I was like, yes, we did. We already got it. I gave it to my kids. They're already applying. They said, no, we're different. So there are two different ones, um, and that one also, that will have like rotary scholarships and that kind of thing. Most of those, those are the awards that like we award at awards night and that kind of thing, um, for the most part. And they'll come and give those out. But that's the primary area. Um, there's a couple, there's websites that you can look for them on, but again, those are primarily going to be the national level scholarships. The last place to check for financial aid, apart from like your employer, is the school itself. Um, Sometimes schools uh, or colleges within a school or even an apartment within a college will have a supplemental scholarship application. So knowing the schools that you've applied to, spend some time looking at the financial aid page and look for a separate scholarship information page. Sometimes they'll make you sign up for something different. Um, also check if you're applying to a certain major. Check that departmental page. Sometimes they'll have a page for only biomedical engineers, a scholarship that might be only applied to them. And it might not go through the college kind of process with the FAFSA. Or they, re, or they want some sort of demonstration of your ability with my, you know, biomedical engineering. Um, that's not just, that doesn't appear on the FAFSA. So those are the, the main places. Um, students might expect to get a couple thousand dollars on average when they graduate. I think if we averaged it out last couple of years, they might get $5,000 out of scholarships. Um, For the full four years. Uh, yeah, well, that, that, that's what they would get awarded in their senior year, which is most typically when students get awarded scholarships. Usually, um, you can do like internships, and sometimes those can carry scholarships or help with finances at later in your college career. Um, but that's the main source. The main source of funding is your federal applications and loans and grants and stuff like that, um, as well as any type of institutional aid.
that's going to be the vast majority of percentage of your amount of where you're getting money for school and your family. Scholarships usually plays a much smaller part, um, unless you get awards, one of those giant ones, which would be nice, but statistically smaller. Um, but still applies, still worth it. Think about it. You've got forty thousand dollars and spent three hours on it. You're never going to make that much money ever again in your life. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks for reminding me about that. Sure. If you guys come up with questions, I know like I do, I listen to something, I'll drive away, I'm like, crap, I forgot to ask that question. Email me, set up an appointment, come and talk. Um, again, a lot of those questions sometimes are more family specific, so I'm happy to sit down and look at it. Just keep in mind, I'm not a financial professional, so I'll do my best. Or get you connected to people who can answer your questions. Yes? Is the FAFSA ID for the student and parent is it the same? Nope, one? different. Yeah. Yes. And I'll need to keep it all, all four years. You can log in, like, if you forget your password for some reason, you can, just like your email, you can get your password resent to you, that kind of thing. Um, when you're signing up for that, one thing to think about to students, do not use your school email address. Just like with your college application, that disappears one year after you guys graduate. So most likely, it'll be hard to recover any type of password if you don't have access to your email. So just keep, in mind, keep that in mind. Any other questions? I do suggest if you guys are curious, go and check. We're having the conference night right now, too, over in the library. Um, senioritis is something to be wary of. So finding out where your students are at might be, not be the worst idea. Spend five minutes, figure it out. Because um, that will affect admissions if senioritis hits too hard. A little bit, not so much. Not, not so bad. But like A's to C's, A's to D's, kind of a big deal. Um, but that'll happen. It's literally like you guys speed dating for teachers. That's what I call it. Um, pop in, ask some questions, head out, go get dinner. Um, but thanks, you guys, for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, if you guys have questions, let me know.